Although the scriptures clearly state in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture will take place after the tribulation, after the tribulation, the after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation of those days, after the tribulation, let's close our Bibles and go home. This is talking about the rapture, and this says it's after the tribulation. But he does tell us that it's after the tribulation, because he said after the tribulation, it's after the tribulation. After the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon shall not give her light. So the Bible's real clear in Matthew 24 that the sun and moon are darkened after the tribulation. We, if we could just get people to understand what the word tribulation means, they would understand that the rapture comes after the tribulation. It's just that people don't understand the word tribulation. Show me one verse that says we're going to be gone before the tribulation, or we're going to be caught up before the tribulation, or the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. Yet I can show you where the Bible point blank says, immediately after the tribulation, after the tribulation. Well, out of all this warfare and, and cataclysm that's going to be taking place during the tribulation, not supernatural cataclysm, not God raining fire and brimstone, but rather uh, natural disasters, warfare, famine caused by human beings, not supernatural cataclysm, not supernatural cataclysm, not supernatural cataclysm caused by human beings after the tribulation. He said in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation, one thing we do know is that it's after the tribulation. Rapture comes after the tribulation. I don't, I don't know if this is going to happen in our lifetime, but I hope that this happens in my lifetime. I hope I can endure that persecution and tribulation. The rapture comes after the tribulation. So, but thank you for the Holy Spirit that just, in that room so many years ago, just cut through all that and just burned these three words into my mind. These three words just burned into my mind from Matthew 24 as a 12-year-old boy after the tribulation. And I pray that those words would sink into the hearts and minds of every person who's here tonight. We love you and thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can you say propaganda? Just slightly. Uh, we're going to be talking about this lie that has been perpetuated by Stephen Anderson and countless of his followers. They'll keep coming out and saying the Bible plainly teaches after the tribulation. Now that's true. But what they're doing is they're taking three words completely out of context. They're not dealing with the context in which it appears and comparing it with those passages that prove that the body of Christ is leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. They won't talk about that. And this thing of taking those three words and proving doctrine with three words out of a verse. Let me show you how that doesn't work, why that is not the kind of scriptural exposition that you should be doing. Did you know that the Bible says, let us do evil that good may come? It does. Absolutely. It's in the book of Romans. Chapter 3, verse 8. Look that verse up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 says, Your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So therefore, there's no really truly saved people. I mean, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. And Romans 3, verse 8 says, Let us do evil that good may come. But you see, when you actually look at the context of Romans 3, verse 8, and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, you'll see that those words being taken out of that verse, you're not reading the whole verse. And when you take those words out, that would be able to prove false doctrine, but you see, you can make the Bible teach whatever you want if you're ripping words completely out of context. And see, the whole system of this post-trib rapture, where the body of Christ goes through this coming time period that they call the tribulation, um, that whole system is false. It's a lie. And I've been referring to this in many, many, many studies that I've done um, on the rapture issue. And I use their term pre-trib rapture because I'm trying to get people to understand what I'm saying, but I will always correct it and say it's not actually called the tribulation. And we're going to look at that today. We're actually going to go through every single reference to the word tribulation. It's going to be a Bible study, okay? Now, of course, if you look at the comments, you're already going to see that there are people from the post-trib camp, the Stephen Anderson cult followers, and they're already posting their comments. 
they're not watching the video, right? I can assure you of that. There's going to be plenty of those. But we're going to use a Strong's Concordance here. Stay away from the Greek. It's corrupt in the back. But we're actually going to look up the word tribulation, and then we'll look at tribulations. And I'm going to prove to you that the King James Bible, not one time is this word tribulation or tribulations, it is never once used as a title, a title for that coming time period. Uh, I'll tell you right up front, the term tribulation is something that people have experienced all through, saved people have experienced all through life. In fact, lost people experience tribulation. Uh, tribulation and is just another way of saying trouble or, or persecution, things like that. We're going to see that in this little word study here today. Uh, it, it's just a ge general description for p things that anybody goes through, really. I mean, you don't have to be saved to go through hard times and troubles and things like that. Everybody experiences tribulation. But in some clever little way, these people have come along and they've taken the word tribulation and they make it into a title for this coming time period. And it's not. We're going to see that. Let's start out here. Tribulation, the very first time it appears, is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. So let's go there. Back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 30. It says here, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice. All right speaking to the Jews. Now, it's ironic because they are actually going to be in this coming time period, but it's not called the tribulation. When thou art in tribulation, it does not say in the tribulation. Okay? That's very important. You see, because the two titles that are given to this coming time period both clearly define who the time period is for. And I've noticed another thing that these uh, posties are doing uh, Stephen Anderson in particular, Ken Hovind also, they'll take the tribulation and they'll make it before the time of Jacob's trouble. So there's actually a seven year or three and a half year, depending on which school of thought you go with, time where God's not even involved in the whole thing. It's just, you know, as you saw there in the beginning, Stephen Anderson, it's, it's not of supernatural, you know, origin here, basically these bad things. It's going to be natural cataclysms and bad things like this. And the Lord's not going to have anything to do with it. And he's teaching Revelation chapter 6 is a description of that time period. But you read Revelation chapter 6, it's very clearly, and chapter 5 specifically in Revelation, it's the Lamb who's found worthy to open the book and to loose the seals, the seven seals. And it's Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is opening the seals in the book of Revelation chapter 6. So right away you can see that Stephen Anderson is a liar. He's a deceiver. And by the way, when I showed there at the beginning, he does this 666 thing here with his hand. He does it all through the movie, all throughout the movie. And uh, did you like his little mind control uh, programming language there too? I want this to burn in your mind after the tribulation. These three words need to burn into your mind. You know what that is? In mind control, that is using an action word to, veiled, to make a veiled threat. Now think about who burned people at the stake? The Roman Catholic Church. Who is Stephen Anderson really working for? Well, let's see. He re teaches replacement theology. He will change the King James Bible. Both of the things that Catholic Church does. And he has, by the way, he'll change the word Christ to Messiah. He'll change it right in the text. He says, well, it means the same thing. It's not written as Messiah, though, you see. I don't care if it does mean the same things. We're not supposed to change the word. You see? He does that, and now he's coming out saying, America is Mystery Babylon, not the Vatican. Stephen Anderson is a Jesuit coadjutor at best, uh, possibly even a full-fledged Jesuit. Now, I don't believe he's fourth vow or anything of the highest level. I don't believe he's there. He's not old enough for that. But the point is, he's definitely working with the Jesuits. More on that is, you know, time allows. We'll be bringing more stuff out about that. But you see this whole thing here, what he's doing is, and the, the, this whole post-trib rapture thing is extremely important to the Jesuit order extremely important to these people. All right? If you believe that the body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble, it destroys Roman Catholic teaching. I've talked about that in another video. I'm not going to go over it again. But you see here, tribulation is something that everybody has. But it's not a title. And when we see the two titles, Daniel's 70th week 
and the time of Jacob's trouble, it clearly is to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. And these people are now trying to divorce that time period with what they call the tribulation. They're trying to separate the two. And there's an important reason for that. But let's continue. Next we have Judges chapter 10, verse 14. Joshua and Judges. Judges chapter 10, verse 14. Let's look at this one. Judges 10, verse 14. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Your tribulation. Okay? Speaking to the people of that day. But it can also be applied to the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming, because a lot of the Jews worship false gods. That's why they're running the star of Remphan, or Chemosh, or whatever you want to make it, Moloch, you know, they have a false star, a six-pointed star, the hexagram. It's not the star of David. You'll not find that uh, term anywhere in the King James Bible. They have false gods in Israel right now. They're still, God still has a promise there. Made to Abraham and his seed. It's perpetual. It'll always be there. All right? But they're worshiping false gods right now. That's the reason for them going into the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Why do I need to go into a, a time to be further purified? See, this purification thing of sufferings and stuff like this to purify yourself, to merit more and more salvation in less and less time in purgatory, it's Roman Catholic. That's why you read in the Catechism about the church's ultimate trial. I've showed that in other videos. The Catechism clearly says that the church goes through this time period that's coming. And you'll hear the defenders of the post-trib rapture, these posties like Ken Hovind and Stephen Anderson and some of these others. Both men were in those, that video there after the tribulation thing. Um, you'll hear them and they'll talk about the historic position of the church. You know who they're referring to? Catholicism. Interesting. Let's go to the next reference. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 24. First Samuel 26, verse 24. You know you can learn a lot about the Bible too, by the way, by doing these word studies. Just go through the Bible, pick a word from your concordance, and just go through and see what the Lord says about this. First Samuel chapter 26, verse 24 says, And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Notice again, it does not say the tribulation. It's all tribulation. Anybody goes through tribulation. Everybody goes through tribulation of some sort. Not American Christians. We have it so easy. Uh, I haven't found it too easy. I haven't found it too easy to live with constant temptation. You know, it's been a lot easier sometimes in the dark ages under total Roman Catholic persecution in the European countries and things over there. It had been a lot easier in many ways because they didn't have the problem of uh, all the electronic smog, all the bad things there, and, and pollution, and GMO foods, and, and you know, geoengineering up above, and pornography everywhere, and immodestly dressed women, you know, what are we going through? We're going through tribulation. Yeah, if you're saved, you have family members turning against you, you've lost jobs, you've had health problems, you've had financial problems, sure, you go through tribulation. But they want you to believe that you're going to have to go through even more bad times, more tribulation coming in the future. And see, they can't, you know, a lot of these guys are starting to abandon the thing of saying, well, it's, you know, the Lord that's putting you through this. They have to abandon that and they say, well, it's just man. Even though the Bible plainly teaches, Revelation chapter 5 and 6, you can just read it for yourself. And it plainly teaches that it's Jesus Christ that's opening these seals. And they somehow say, oh, you know, don't worry about it. It's not that bad. Oh, it's, it's, it, you know, we can get through it. It's just persecution that comes. It's, it's going to be there. The tribulation, we're going to go through this tribulation. Just don't worry about it. It's not that bad. It's not that bad knowing that your Savior, your Lord, your heavenly husband, so to speak, as we are the bride of Christ, it's not a bad thing knowing that He is the one who's causing these bad things in your life. It's a weird system, these post posties. 
I, I forget which one of you put that in the comments, but I love that term. I'm going to be using it now. Uh, Lord gave me another one the other day. You know, they say the if you're a sodomite, they say you come out of the closet. Well, I think a lot of these preachers, these posty preachers, are starting to come out of the confessional. They're not coming out of the closet. Although some might do that too. I don't know. I've always been waiting for Andrew Snake to do that. But, uh, you know, they're coming out of the uh, confessional, meaning they're Catholics. They're closet Catholics. You look at a lot of their teachings, a lot of their beliefs, it lines up with Roman Catholicism. But now let's go to the New Testament. So we had three references to tribulation in the Old Testament. Not once was it a title of this coming time period. But uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 13, and we'll see about this. You know, in, the, in this propaganda flick uh, after the tribulation, uh, I didn't watch the whole thing before. Uh, it's been out for a few years now, and I, I watched it the other day just to see how many times does he actually say after the tribulation. It's all through the movie, after the tribulation, after the tribulation, just drilling it into people's minds. Total propaganda film. I mean, good night. But uh, I watched it, and he shows there are multiple references to tribulation, and uh, or the tribulation, you know. And, uh, and he'll say it. It only, it only says after the tribulation, never says before the tribulation. And it's this continual mind control, this, this double think thing going on there, where tribulation is things that Christians have, and so therefore we know that since we have tribulation, we're going into the tribulation. And it's like, so, okay, you're saying uh, we, don't, we can't prove from the King James Bible that the tribulation is a title for the time period, all it means is that Christians have tribulation, so therefore it proves that they're going to go into the tribulation. I'm going, <laughs> what is this? Jesuit mind control is what the thing is, I'm telling you. Uh, the Jesuits are masters at sophistry. Sophistry is basically where they answer a question without answering the question. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of an example here. Um, you know, uh, were you at the scene of the murder? Um, I don't know what you mean by scene of the murder. Or something like this, you know. They'll, 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 they do all this weird, these little mind games, these little tricks. And of course, it's spirit-led. It's led by devil spirits that inhabit these people. That's why when you listen to a sermon by Stephen Anderson or by some of these other people, it's like you come out more confused than when you went into the thing. You're going, what does he teach? What I, I, you know? They confuse you. But it's interesting because the Bible says God hath, you know, that that God is not the author of confusion. So, but let's continue. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Uh, where are we at here? Okay, previous page. Matthew 13, verse 21. We'll start at verse 20. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Sure. Yeah, that's, that's there. You know, you're going to see that with people that profess to be Christians. Uh, they, you know, there's a lot of people that are easy believism type of people. They go to some Babel building somewhere and they get caught up in the emotions and they go forward and they pray some prayer. They kneel down at the altar. You know, come forward to an old-fashioned altar and give your life to Christ. Oh, and all this. And they fall for it, you know, and they, they go up front and they do the church thing for a while, organized religion thing, Sunday best and all this other stuff. And after a while... It wasn't real. Their conversion wasn't real. It was just a fake little emotional thing. So after a while, things start to fall apart for them, and they start to get some persecution and whatever, and they just go, and they turn their back on God. And you talk to them, and they say, yeah, I'm an atheist now. I, I was raised in, in Christianity. I was raised as a Christian. Now I hate God. I don't believe that God exists. You know what you have? Somebody that's described right there. But again, did we see this term, the tribulation as a time period that's coming in the future. No, it's not there. Let's continue. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Oh boy, here's the big one. Here's the big one. This is the one that they're going to, you know, uh, no, okay, sorry, that would be the next one. But this is another one that they'll use. Matthew 24, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as, as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Did it say there shall be the great tribulation? No, just great tribulation. And it will be a time of great trouble, a great time of great persecution and, and evil and everything else. Time of great tribulation. It's a description. It is not a title. And as I said, stay tuned. That's going to be important later. 
why I'm making such a point about this. Now, here's the next one. Sorry, I got my references mixed up. Chapter or, uh, Verse 29 of the same chapter. 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And they say, see, there's the rapture and it's clearly after the tribulation. Well, now think about this. Think about this for a minute. If people have been in tribulation since Back in the Old Testament times, since the world was formed, man has experienced tribulation. Now, if tribulation is a time period that's coming in the future, um, how's that going to work out? I mean, the rapture could happen before the time of Jacob's trouble, or Daniel's 70th week, whichever you want to call it, and you could call that after the tribulation, you know, if you really wanted to. But think about the argument here, Okay. When the rapture happens, are you going to be leaving tribulation in your life? Yes, I will be. See, their argument falls apart, but they have to use the word tribulation for this time period. Because if they use the two real titles in the King James Bible that are given, I don't know about the new versions, the ones from the Vatican, I have no idea, but the two titles that are given in your King James Bible, the 70th week of Daniel there, Daniel's 70th week. We're going to be looking at it here in a couple minutes. And the time of Jacob's trouble. If they use those two terms, it just wipes out their whole system. Because both terms make it clear that this coming time period is for the nation of Israel. Unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews. That's who this time period is coming for. See? Wipes out their whole thing. So they have to take the word tribulation and make it into a, a term for this coming time period. But look at, the, look at the text. Let's look at the text again here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. All right, keep your hand right there in Matthew 24 and go to 1 Corinthians. See, this is where they start to fall apart because they'll, all through the movie, you know, it's just clear. It's clear what part of after the tribulation, don't you understand? What part? What part? Let's look about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Christians require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Oh, man. I'm sorry. No, it says, for the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Is that talking about saved Jews or lost Jews? Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. The context is lost Jews. Is God going to give a sign to a Jew right now in the church age for them to be saved? Nope. Nope. A Jew right now doesn't get signs. They did in the early part of the book of Acts. While it was still there, the, the, uh, they were still given, you know, before God, you know, basically said, okay, you're going to be blinded for a while there, you know, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You know, they had an opportunity. They were signs given to confirm the word. But those signs have gone away. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14 does give some signs that I believe are still around. And the thing of speaking in tongues, you know, it's so funny because the charismaniacs will come out, we believe in speaking in tongues. Well, I do too. I believe that there are people that can learn all kinds of different languages. They have a talent from God to learn different languages. Well, that's not what tongues means. Oh, yes, it is. Read Acts chapter 2. The tongues are listed by name. There are no unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. The unknown tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, it says that there's supposed to be an interpreter. If I start ripping off some kind of a language that you don't know, well, there needs to be an interpreter so that you can tell what I'm saying. You see? Those gift of tongues are there. It's languages. And by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks the gifts, the gifts, plural, of healing. You don't need multiple gifts of healing if you can supernaturally lay your hands on people on the sick and they recover. But you see, in the church age, 
after that early time where signs were given to confirm the word, now, today, there are gifts, multiple gifts of healing, nutritional therapy, natural health, herbal healing, you see? And that's all. There's a whole bunch more. There are gifts, plural, of healing. You didn't need that, though, and it was supernatural. But you see here, in the text, it's the Jews that require a sign. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Um, could you please show me one place in the Pauline epistles where the term Son of Man is used? What do we care? I'm a Gentile. What do I care about uh, who Jesus, the genealogy and all the other stuff and his, his line going back to David and Solomon and all this? What do I care about that? My ancestors were would have been the heathen in the Old Testament. The Germanic peoples. You see? Who's concerned about the genealogy of Jesus? That would be the Jews. And by the way, he has done something with the whole, you know, Jeconiah being, you know, that line being cursed from then on. And so only a supernatural, you know, birth coming into that situation. And it's just amazing how the Lord worked it out. You can... Uh, I think it's answering a Jewish rabbi's objections to Jesus. And I covered it in there. It's, a, it's very detailed, so I can't get into it here. But very interesting. Jesus Christ being born of the Virgin Mary is the only one that can fulfill that true descending from David, the Davidic line. And the Jews have it as a sign. And you have back there in the Old Testament, it's a sign that comes that a virgin is going to conceive and bear a son. And that's the Messiah. And so the Vatican versions that over here, I point over that way because that's where I keep them over on that shelf. The Vatican versions change it from virgin to a young woman. Hmm. That's not a sign. Hey, look at this great sign from God. A young woman has a child. That's not a sign. But a virgin that conceives, oh, that's a big sign. You see? God gives signs for those unbelieving Jews. But in the time of Jacob's trouble. If you're a Jew right now, there are no signs that God's going to give to you. I need to see a sign before I can accept Jesus. Okay, then wait for the rapture. That'll be your first one. And then that starts the time of Jacob's trouble. And you're going to get seven years of signs. And it's going to be a nightmare. Get saved right now. Come to God as the sinner that you are. Give up your self-righteousness. Quit thinking that you're going to be somehow resurrected because you're a Jew and you're faithful to Judaism and things like this. Uh-uh. You come to God as a sinner and put your faith in Jesus Christ. But let's turn another place here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. I'm going to show you another little problem here. Why uh, Matthew 24, verse 29 has absolutely nothing to do with what goes on for Christians. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Okay? Stop right there. You can read down to verse 58. Uh, great promises for us as Christians. Uh, where does it say anything about people being changed there? Where does it say anything in Matthew chapter 24 about the dead coming up? It doesn't. There's another problem, though. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. What is the twinkling of an eye? You ready? Did you see it? I'll do it again. The twinkling of an eye. It's kind of like the blinking of an eye. A twinkle, kind of a, you know, you see a twinkle in somebody's eye or whatever. It's the twinkling of an eye. Boom, like that. That's the rapture. That's what's being spoken of right there. Paul says, I show you a mystery. Well, no, Paul. It's already been revealed in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus was talking about it when he was still on the earth. What are you writing to the Corinthians years and years and years later saying, I'm showing you a mystery. People knew about the second coming. You see? You compare Scripture with Scripture. You rightly divide the word of truth. So you look and you say, who's Jesus speaking to here in Matthew chapter 24? He's talking to the Jews. The Jews that require a sign. You see? Now, I know if, you're, if you've been brainwashed by the posty liars out there, the toasty posties, you know, if you've been brainwashed, a lot of this stuff is probably giving you a headache right now, 
right? Uh, that's because the Bible says, when, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap teachers to themselves having itching ears. That's Stephen Anderson and his followers. People look for that stuff. But you see there, the rapture that's described in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 down through 58 there, that rapture happens like this. In a moment, it's like that. Boom. It happens. Boom. But if it's there after the tribulation of those days, and it says here, the sun shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Um, wouldn't it be kind of a giveaway if all that stuff happened? How could you say it's in a moment the twinkling of an eye? No, it isn't. If these are two, this, you know, and you'll see in the movie, you know, this, this stupid idiotic movie, and uh, this little uh, Roger Jimenez guy, and he comes out and he goes, he goes, it, you know, it's, it's, it's describing the same event. It's the same event. How can it be? Hey, look at that. Sun darkened. Moon doesn't give us light. Stars falling from heaven. The powers of the heavens being shaken. Oh, here comes Jesus. How's that in the moment in the twinkling of an eye? I mean, do you really think that everything, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, and the stars falling from heaven, the powers of the heavens being shaken, can just be like that? Boom, it's over. You no, know, you see, this is talking about, Matthew 24 is talking about the second coming. You see, well, the rapture would be the second coming, so it'd have to make Matthew 24 the third coming. No, you see, because the second coming is when Jesus comes down to the earth. That's what it's talking about. The rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 through 18, and Ephesians chapter 1, pretty much the whole chapter. The rapture, we go up to meet him. He isn't coming down to the earth, you see. So that's not a coming of Jesus. That's us leaving. We're going. See, these posties, they have, they have a hard time with plain English. Very hard time with plain English. And we could keep going off and off about this whole thing. Matthew chapter 24 has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 says that a testament is a force after men are dead. The New Testament does not start doctrinally until Jesus dies on the cross. Obviously. Right? They weren't in the New Testament here in Matthew chapter 24. Doctrinally, I know in the collection of books it's there, but doctrinally it's in the Old Testament. Read the book of Matthew. It's just incredible. These people can't understand this. And it's it's unfortunately it's willful ignorance. But go next to Math or uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 13, verse 24. You know, if you want the truth, the truth is there. That's the whole thing. A lot of these people, oh, I just can't see what you're saying. I just can't. Yeah, because you don't want to look. You know, I just can't see any arguments for the pre-trib rapture. I just don't see it. I just can't see it in the scriptures. Well, open your eyes. Take your hands away from your eyes. And then you'll see it. Mark chapter 13 and verse 24. Where are we at here? But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall... Uh, be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. All right? So we're reading very similar to what's going on there in Ma uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. But again, it does not say after the tribulation. It's just that tribulation. Why? Because tribulation has been experienced by people for thousands of years. It is not a title for the time, coming time period. John chapter 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And they cover this verse in this stupid little documentary, and they're like, see, in the world you're going to have tribulation. So that proves you go into the tribulation. <laughs> like, come on. Give me a break. Tribulation is something that anybody has. Saved and lost, both will have tribulation in this life. Okay? Now, if you have... Jesus Christ, then you'll have the first part there. These things I have uh, spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. We can have peace that passeth understanding, the Bible talks about. We can have that. If you're saved, you have peace. If you're lost, you're going to continually look for peace. And it's going to flee from you. 
Kind of like trying to catch a $100 bill in the middle of a hurricane. All right, it's going to be blowing all over the place. You're going to be running everywhere like a chicken with its head cut off trying to find that, grab onto the thing. As soon as you get close to it, it goes away. That's the way pursuing peace is without Jesus Christ. When you want peace and you're a lost person, you stop and you stand still. And you say, God, I want peace. My self-righteousness, I'm not going to go chasing after peace anymore. I know I can't find it. I know I'll never catch it. All right? I'm going to stay right here until I know that I'm saved. And that peace that passeth understanding will come upon you. When you truly come to God in that broken, contrite spirit, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, where there is no more self-righteousness, there's no more, I'm a good person, you know that you're a rotten person. You know that you can't do anything to merit your salvation. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to pay for your sins. That's why. And you say, I want a new life. Not, I'm going to have salvation and keep my old life. Oh, no, 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 no. You say, I don't know whatever, what all is going to happen or whatever you're going to tell me to do, Lord, but whatever it costs me, I don't care. Whatever this new life is going to be about, I could care less. I need to just be saved. Please, God, save me. Clean up this mess of a life that I have. He'll do it. He'll do it. But again, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. Been true for anybody. Not a title. Continuing. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Here's another one that they quoted in the propaganda film put out by Jesuits R Us. Funny, you know, Anderson comes out and he's got all these inflammatory you know, remarks, you know, sodomites should be put to death and all this other stuff. We should kill the, he calls them homosexuals, doesn't even use a biblical term. But, uh, you know, they should be put to death. And yet his movie's produced by Paul Wittenberger. Paul Wittenberger works for a lesbian film called The Itty Bitty Titty Campaign. Look it up. I've done videos on that. He's working with a guy who's working for the sodomite community, but Anderson's saying that sodomites should be put to death. You know what he is? Fake. He's not a King James Bible-believing preacher. Anderson, Stephen Anderson, is not a saved man. I don't have any conviction at all about saying that. I, I'm not, well, maybe I've seen so much proof over the years, the guy's not saved. He is a fake, just like his mentor, Jack Hiles. Uh, a womanizing, uh, fornicating adulterer. Uh, and a covetous mammon worshiper as well. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Let's read this and see if we can find a title here for this the tribulation that they say. It says here, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Through the tribulation, enter in? That's what they try to make it in this little propaganda film. Oh, see, you've got to go through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. So see, you go through the tribulation and enter into the millennial kingdom. It's not what it says. That's not what it says. That's lying about the text. Through much tribulation. Um, who was being spoken to there? People in the end times? We must through much of the tribulation go into the kingdom of God. No, it's talking about any Christian that's ever lived. Any Christian that ever lives is going to go through some level of tribulation. But you're not going to go through a titled time period, the tribulation. It's just not there. All right? Again, this doesn't prove that there's a coming time period that's called the tribulation. So why are they using this thing after the tribulation, trying to make it into a title? Interesting. They're deceivers. Continuing, Romans chapter 2, verse 9. We'll start at verse 8, actually. We'll go up there to get into proper context. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. Does it say the tribulation? No. Again, it is something that is going to be true for anybody. If you mess around, those that are contentious, you're going to have some tribulation. Yeah, I'll tell you, you will go through tribulation in this life as a Christian. That is true. But when you really get your life, when you get things 
where you've been through the process of sanctification or you're, you're, you're really giving up things for the Lord and you're, you're working for the Lord and you're going to see God's blessings on you in an amazing way. And a lot of those tribulations that you can go through as a Christian, many of them are the fault of Christians. Okay, if you're, if you're not eating the right kind of food and you're, you know, not getting the right kind of sleep, you're not working at the right kind of a job or whatever, a lot of the tribulation that you're experiencing is your fault. Okay, it's just the kind of company that you're in, the kind of circles that you're running in, the kind of lifestyle that you have. But when you do things right, when you start to, to clean up your life and you start to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you to provide for this or I'm going to trust you to, you told me to, to get rid of that, so I'm going to do it. And, you, you know, when you start to do that, you're going to see a lot of that tribulation going away. Now, there's a, never going to come a point in time when you're just going to live trouble free here on the earth. No, you're always going to have some kind of a trouble, always going to have some level of tribulation on you. But uh, you can clean your life up pretty good down here and you can live a pretty blessed life down here I believe that okay not a Joel Olstein your best life now nothing like that but you can live a blessed life down here as a Christian the Lord can really do great things through you and for you but you see there again tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile so it's talking about bad things coming because you're living in sin every soul of man that doeth evil when you do evil, you will have trouble. Tribulation. It has nothing to do with a coming time period. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. It says here, Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So you can glory in tribulations. That's one of the references to the plural there, tribulations. Again, it is not a title for that coming time period. And if you were to go into that time period, and if it was called the tribulation, how could you glory in that time? Yes, Jesus is opening the seals, and we're under God's wrath right now. And the wrath begins at the very beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. Re Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. It's the Lord is opening the first seal, unleashing the Antichrist on the earth. Why? Well, you read over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's talking about, God sending them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. How are you going to get damned by the Antichrist? Take his mark, worship the image, worship him, and you get what? Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11. You get God's wrath. So these liars, again, they'll say it's so important to distinguish. The wrath is not at the beginning. Jesus is not opening the first seal. It's all just done by human beings. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. They're deceivers. They're lying to you. But let's continue. Again, you see it's not a title. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Or do we, do we read uh, chapter 5, verse 3? Yeah. Yeah, Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 35. Okay, where are we at here? Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Okay. Um, well, if you want to make the tribulation a time period, uh, you can be separated from Christ in that time. So again, it would cause a contradiction in Scripture. These people, by using the term the tribulation for that coming time period, it would actually contradict what's going on here. Why? Why? If you go into that time period, you take the mark of the beast, you are separated from the love of Christ. What's it talking about? It's talking about the tribulations that come upon a Christian throughout their life. Old Testament saints have tribulations. Christians within the body of Christ have tribulations in their life. Time of Jacob's trouble saints will have tribulations in their life. Yeah, that's another one of the things that these dumb posties will do. They'll say, there are saints mentioned in Revelation that are in the time of Jacob's trouble there in this tribulation time period. What do you do with that? Well, there's saved people in any dispensation. Of course. Well, who's going to lead them to the Lord if the body of Christ is gone? Uh, could it be the Holy Spirit? Could it be that a lot of the people that get left behind are actually going to realize for the first time, I wasn't saved? Might want to think about that. But again, not a title, a description. But let's continue. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Verse 12. 
Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Uh, well, how would you be patient in tribulation? If the tribulation is what it's talking about here. What do you mean patient in the tribulation? Let's be patient. We know what seal is going to open next. Or we, let's be patient. We know what trump or what vial or whatever. And we know how many years we have left and things like this. It's not a title for that coming time period. It, tribulation all throughout the Bible is a reference to what saved and lost go through. And saved people, their tribulation is different because we have a way out of it. We have a way to be helped. We can have peace in the midst of a tribulation. Okay? A time of tribulation, I'll say it that way. When you are going through those rough times, your whole life isn't just going to be all one solid, you know, terrible tribulation time. You're going to have times of, of peace. You're going to have times where you get to enjoy, you know, uh, life. It's really not that difficult to figure this stuff out. And, you know, when we go scripture with scripture, they'll go, well, they're so confusing. They go all over the Bible. Yeah, that's called, uh, you know, sound doctrine. Comparing scripture with scripture with scripture with scripture. But uh, let's continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Second Corinthians 1, verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, okay, if that's a reference to the coming tribulation, um, how could we be comforted of God when it's God that's pouring out those judgments upon us? Kookyville. Nuts. People are crazy. Uh, no, it's talking about the troubles that you're going to have in your life as a Christian. It has nothing to do with the coming time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 says here, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Are you exceeding joyful when you go through problems and things in this life? Well, maybe not sometimes because you're, you, it's pretty bad, but you come out of it and it's just like, praise Lord, I'm glad I, I went through that and I didn't deny the Lord. You can have exceeding joy in your tribulation as a Christian. Could you have exceeding joy if you went into a time period in the future that's called the tribulation? Could you have exceeding joy in that, knowing it's the Lord that's doing it to you? Isn't that weird? Slightly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. 1 you know, little Anders Snakey is like, if we could just get people to understand what this word tribulation means, well, that's what we're doing right now. And if you do understand what the word tribulation means, it proves that they lied to you. All throughout that propaganda film. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should have or we should suffer tribulation, even as it is even as it came to pass, and ye know. Alright? Uh, you should suffer tribulation. Well, then they were in the tribulation back then. No, no. They're suffering the troubles. They're suffering hardships and things like that, just like anybody else. That's all it's saying there. So why would you come and take this term tribulation and make it into a time period? It's the tribulation that's coming. They're lying. They're deceiving. It's incredible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. It says here, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Okay. Well, again, you see the thing there that tribulation comes on saved and lost. This world is a world of troubles. It's a world of heartaches and, and, and hardship and, and bad things like that. Both saved and lost experience it. So again, why would you take that term tribulation and make it into this future time period? Because they're deceivers. They can't handle the two real terms that I've been saying throughout this video. Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble. They can't handle it. But let's continue. Uh, where are we at here? Revelation 1, 9. Revelation chapter 1. Okay, 
There we go. Verse 9. I, John, who, am, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you say, well, the tribulation there is obviously talking about this coming time period, the, the great tribulation. Uh, well, how did that work? I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Uh, but I thought John was in heaven for that time. He has the book of Revelation revealed to him. So how could he be in the tribulation when he's in heaven? No, John is talking about what he's going through in his life. Just like any Christian has had to suffer. You might not be exiled to an uh, island someplace, but the point is, you're suffering as a Christian. Excuse me. Revelation 2, verse 9. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Again, Stephen Anderson falls right in line with that. All right. He teaches that the Jews are the synagogue of Satan, and he's replaced it, the Jews. That's Roman Catholic replacement theology, taught by the Roman Catholic Church for centuries, because they want to take all the promises that God has for the nation of Israel and apply it to them. They want that land. That's why the Vatican can, currently controls the city of Jerusalem. It's an international city. Why? Because that's where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from. Matthew chapter 5 talks about that. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. So guess where the Pope's going to put his throne? Jerusalem. Guess where the Antichrist is going to rule and reign from? Jerusalem. Yeah, they're counterfeiting what Jesus Christ is going to do. So it's interesting. But these people that come along and teach replacement theology, they're the ones that are saying that they're Jews, but they're not. But it's so funny, they'll say, no, but it's actually the Jews are the synagogue of Satan. Well, how does that work? They can say that they are Jews, and they are. They're Jews according to the flesh. Plain English, people. Plain English. Continuing, Revelation 2, verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Paul is writing here to the church of uh, Smyrna, the church in Smyrna. There, read about that in verse 8. Now, the, the day of tribulation? Yeah, they did. Well, then that means that the tribulation, the seven-year time period of the tribulation happened back then in the first century. No, it didn't. It meant that they had tribulation, they had trouble, persecution, just like any group of Christians ever has had and ever will have. You get it? Go down to Revelation 2, verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Talking about their Jezebel, which is a reference, I believe, to Roman Catholicism. You compare that to Revelation 17 and 18, You'll see it's talking about the same system. But you see there, uh, them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. It does not say the great tribulation. It's just simply saying the trouble that comes upon all people is going to be that much greater in that time that's coming. It's going to be great tribulation, not the great tribulation. Again, it is not a title. That is so important. We're going to be getting to that very soon here. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And you need to be following along here, by the way, too. You know, I, I didn't say that at the beginning of the video, but you, you really need to have a, a paper-based King James Bible and actually follow along. When I say turn to Revelation 7, ver verse 14, look it up. I'm not going to be putting these scriptures up on the screen for you to look at and everything else and just sit there, uh, like, vegging out, and, you know, you need to listen to it. When you listen to preaching, you need to have the King James Bible right in front of you, a paper-based King James Bible. Put it right in front of you, and you check what I'm saying. You check what other preachers are saying to you. Check it. You compare Scripture with Scripture. That's what you do. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, here's a group of people. It says there in uh, verse 9, 
a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and or people and tongues. It's talking about saved uh, Gentile nations, basically, in that time of Jacob's trouble that's coming. There, these people get saved. And, but it says there, these are they which came out of great tribulation. It does not say the great tribulation. Again, it's not a title. It's a description. They've come out of a great time of trouble, this great tribulation. But look at the rest of the verse there. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There is works involved in salvation in that time period. It's coming up. We do not wash our robes right now in the blood of the Lamb. We ourselves are washed. My sins are washed away by the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. Okay? But in that time period that's coming, they have to wash their own robes. Why? Read Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Faith in Jesus and keeping the commandments. We'll be doing another video on that here, too, coming up. But um, So that's last reference to tribulation. Now let's go to uh, tribulations. 1 Samuel chapter 10, back to the Old Testament again. Um, again, if you're looking this up and you're not real familiar with the Bible, then just pause the video here and look it up. And as soon as you find 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19, start the video. Excuse me. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 19. And ye have this day rejected your God, and him, who himself saved you out of all your adver adversities and your tribulations... And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So this is something that the people were going through back then. It was not some kind of a time that they went through that you know was before it was even revealed in the New Testament or later on in the Old Testament, the books of Jeremiah and Daniel there. Um, this is something that people have gone through, you know, tribulations. Now let's look at the other three uh, references, Romans 5, verse 3. Back to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. Romans 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. We read that one earlier. But again, you see the thing there of tribulations. It's not a title for the coming time period. And uh, two more. Ephesians 3, verse 13. Ephesians 3, 13. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. It's not a coming time period. I think we've established that by now. If you still believe that, then, you know, I don't know what to say for you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. It says here, So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Britain to the people back there. The uh, church in uh, Thessalonica there, basically. The Thessalonian believers. All right, so it's something that anybody's going to have at any point in time. Again, that's all the references we've gone through now. I've been talking about this in many studies and things, and, and now I've, you know, it's been proven. Somebody comes along and says, we're going to go into the Great Tribulation, or the Tribulation, just say, is that a title? Because it's not. But let me show you why they can't actually go to the actual Scriptures here. Turn back to your Old Testament, I, the book of Jeremiah, excuse me. Jeremiah chapter 30. I kick a couple things here. Jeremiah chapter 30. Um, verse 7, we'll just go there for now. It says here, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now remember, Matthew 24, 29, the big thing that these post tribbers will use immediately after the tribulation of those days. They'll use that. And it's a sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. It's a sign that's there. Right? And who requires a sign? The Jews. So what it's, what's it talking about here? Uh, it is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Who is Jacob? What's his other name? Israel. Again, you can read about that in the Old Testament here. Jacob is Israel. So it's the time of Israel's trouble, if you want to be technical. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Not the time of the church's trouble. Not the time of the body of Christ's trouble. The bride of Christ's trouble. It's not there. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, totally debunks this whole, you know, after the tribulation, making it into the title for this coming time period. Totally destroys that doctrine, that teaching. That's why they have to get rid of it. But I want you to notice something here. Go up to uh, verse 4, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah <laughs> to the Jews. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And you can keep going down through there. Um, we're not going to go through all these verses. But why are there men going like this? Holding on to their stomachs. Because they're starving. Why are they starving? Because they can't buy or sell unless they have the mark. You see? Uh, well, when does the mark of the beast system, when do they initiate that? When is that thing brought to pass? Or instituted, I should say, maybe not initiated. But when is it brought to pass? At the beginning, at the end, or halfway through? At the beginning. Why? Because the Antichrist, being unleashed, he goes out and he makes the peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. It's right there. So, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. These people here, these men are starving because they can't take the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast shows up right at the beginning of that whole time period. So you can't say, well, it's, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble is the last half. Or it's seven years and there's a little bit of time into the Millennial Kingdom, three and a half years or something like this, into the Millennial Kingdom, like Kevin Hoven teaches, which is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Uh, Roland Rasmussen is the mind control programmer that uh, warped Ken Hoven's mind on that. But... Uh, Another story. But so you see it there. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. And I don't care what your little special little notes and this preacher says it's the last half or something. No, it isn't. It's the beginning. The whole way through. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Perfect description of that time period. Now go to Daniel, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the, the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Do we need any of that stuff as Christians? And are we um, thy people, thy holy city? What is the holy city on earth here? For a Christian, we don't have one. So who has this holy city? That would be the Jews. It's right there. And you know, look at the rest of the verse. To finish the transgression. What transgression? My sins are paid for at the cross. I haven't rejected Jesus as Messiah, as, as my Messiah. I'm not a Jew, so I don't technically have a Messiah. You see? To make an end of sins. My sins are already paid for on the cross. Jesus Christ's righteousness has been imputed to me and to you if you're saved. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Already done. Again, why does the body of Christ have to go into this time period? The work's already been paid for. Everything's already been done for a Christian. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Don't we already have that? Doesn't Ephesians chapter 1 say that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption? Weird. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Hmm. Um, I thought those things were already there for a Christian. You see? So these uh, posties, they have to come out and they have to say, 
We can't use Daniel's 70th week. We can't use Jeremiah 30, verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. What are we going to call it? Let's call it the tribulation. And so they invent a term, a title for this time period that appears nowhere in the King James Bible as a title, as a unique title for that time period. You know why they do that? Because their father is the father of lies. Just the way it is. So that is going to do it for this study. I've been wanting to put this thing together for a while. Um, there is no argument. You know, I mean, the more you study this whole rapture timing thing and whatever else, and when we get called up to be with the Lord, the more you study it, it's just like, why is there even a debate here? It's crystal clear. The body of Christ is leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. We literally cannot be here for that time period. It's not possible. You say, well, it's debatable. It's not debatable. There is no debate. There is no argument. All right? If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, you have to understand from the Pauline epistles, your salvation is not complete until you get over there to the redemption of your body. You should be earnestly groaning, desiring to be with the Lord and to be clothed upon with immortality. That should be there for you as a Christian. You say, well, you know, I, I just think that we're going to go into it. Well, check and make sure that you're saved. Seriously. I'm quite serious about that. Because you see, you get these Stephen Anderson types and stuff like this. They'll tell you false profession of salvation like they themselves have. And you can just go on continuing in your life of sin and whatever else. And you can just kind of do your thing and fake people and lie when you need to and whatever. They'll do that. They're trying to deceive you. They're trying to destroy you. So that is going to be it for this study. Uh, this thing of the tribulation after the tribulation, it's a lie. I'm telling you right now. They're ripping three words completely out of context. You can't exposit uh, Scripture that way. You cannot go through Scripture and say, well, see, I can prove such and such because these three words and those two words. and uh, No, that doesn't work. Uh, don't fall for uh, Stephen Anderson's little propaganda films that he's coming out with. And he's trying to, you know, promote, start to promote this, this thing of that uh, America is Mystery Babylon, not the Vatican. He's, he's, he's a servant of the Vatican. Definitely, I have no, I have no question about that. And um, I think that's going to be it. Um, trying to catch up on some sleep here. I've been missing a lot, so I'm sorry if I'm getting a little bit groggy here towards the end of this study. But uh, and I've been needing to do this study. I've been I've been really wanting to get this thing done because you know it's it's important. I mean, in the comments all the time, you know, well, the Bible says after the tribulation. The Bible says after the tribulation. We're just like you know I need to put something together on that and just show people. Uh, the Bible says after the tribulation of those days. Right. The Bible never gives this time period it's coming. It never gives it the title of the tribulation. It's only ever called the time of Jacob's trouble, and the 70th week here in the book of Daniel. So, um, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Please keep us in your prayers.